Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight as we continue our study through Psalm 119. Tonight we're going to be looking at verses 89 through 96. Let me read the text for you. The writer, the, the psalmist writes, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have uh, perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit uh, to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Let me just begin with that last line here as we look at this passage. God's word is exceedingly broad, right? God's commandment, God's word, God's ordinances, God, God's precepts, all of these things are kind of synonymous in, in one way. Uh, they're exceedingly broad and they address every issue that concerns humanity. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about creation, as I think the psalmist is talking a bit about that. Uh, but God's Word speaks to that. God's Word speaks to the human condition. God's Word speaks to the issue of sin. God's Word speaks to uh, you know, moral issues, social issues, family issues, all these different things. God's Word is exceedingly broad. And the point that the psalmist makes uh, right, right up front and repeatedly uh, is that, that, that it's permanent. There's a permanence about God's Word. Look at what it says in verse 89. Your Word is settled in heaven. Uh, that literally means stands firm. And then he repeats. Um, it's a different word, but, but he says in essence the same thing. You established the earth and it stands, verse 90. And verse 91, they stand this day according to your ordinances. So he's made a very clear point over and over here about the, the permanence, that God's word is, is completely settled and it stands firm. And, and even that idea, where does it stand firm? It stands firm in heaven, in heaven, which is the, the ruling place, if you will, of God. Um, it's challenged here on earth but it stands firm in heaven, and ultimately it does stand firm forever. The other day I read a, an article about the extinction of uh, the dinosaurs and how that was caused by an asteroid impact on Earth about 66 million years ago. I was intrigued by the article, and, and so I read that article and a couple of similar articles uh, written about these latest findings, right? And as I parsed the information, it was apparent that really this was speculation. And though there were words used like discovered and found and concluded, it was apparent that it was speculation. It was theory. It was literally imagination. Um, and it, these things had been arrived at by scientists who have completely ignored uh, a whole body of evidence of, of things that are actually scientifically observable. What is observable is obvious that dinosaurs were wiped out, right? That dinosaurs roamed the earth and that they were wiped out and seemingly relatively quickly by some type of worldwide catastrophe, right? Some event that seems to have changed the climate of earth very rapidly. Subsequently, I read a couple of really great articles that counter the notion of the asteroid impact. And they cite the fact that there's actually no crater evidence. Although there is what appears to be maybe a crater uh, in Mexico, uh, they kind of counter that and say that's not a crater impact. You know, there's other explanations for it, but it's not a crater because of its size and dimensions. Um, and also they, they talk about the fact that these dinosaur bones that are being discovered and have been discovered, uh, they contain a good deal of soft tissue that remains, uh, indicating that perhaps they are a few thousand years old, but definitely not 
millions of years old and, and, and certainly not 66 million years old as the scientists speculate. I'll, I'll post a link to both uh, to a few of these articles so you can read them and check it out for yourself and I, I would just encourage you to do so and, and see what seems logical and what seems evidence-based versus speculation-based. But the whole idea is that God's Word literally it stands firm. Um, God's Word tells us that He established the earth. I think this is pretty clear in Scripture, that God established the earth, that God created man, that God created the animals, that God created all things that are visible, something that modern-day so-called scientists absolutely deny. Uh, God's Word tells us very clearly that there was a worldwide cataclysmic event, a flood event that killed every living thing on the planet that was not saved on the ark. And the psalmist is simply here affirming what God's Word says, right? God's Word stands, it's broad, it covers everything, but also the idea that it's unaffected by the assault of man. It's unaffected by man's speculations. It's settled. It stands. As believers in Jesus Christ, I think this is a very, very important thing for us to understand and also to hold on to and to believe. We must believe in God's Word and hold on to it very, very tightly. Uh, and we should hang on to it with absolute certainty. It does not change, and it is eternal truth. Jesus Himself said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but My words will not pass away. It stands. There is a permanence. And as the psalmist says, your faithfulness, this is relating to God's Word, it continues throughout all generations. All generations. It's established. It's established in the earth. And it stands. Now, I think there's a second thought. I'm just going to really just pull out two thoughts. So, so first, there's this idea that the Word of God is settled. There's, the Word of God stands. Uh, but the second thought here um, is that uh, has to do with what, what he mentions here in verse 91, as he says, They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. Now, the idea of ordinances, ordinance are, ordinances are kind of like government, right? Um, they're interconnected with God's word, but it's God's rule, God's judgment, God's government that comes first from his word. So you could say that maybe his ordinances are a result of his word. Um, and he says this, all these things, God's word, God's ordinances, they are your servants. God's word and God's ordinances exist to serve the purposes of God. I think sometimes people have a misunderstanding about our proper relationship with God, and we can almost see God uh, like a mythical genie whose purpose is to make our lives better, right? God ends up serving us in uh, our wants and desires and needs, even in our personal preferences. And I think this is a real problem in the church today, especially in the West, where we have a culture and an economy that is completely based on customer service. I don't know about you, but man, I, I like good customer service. When I go uh, shopping, uh, when I go to a restaurant, uh, you know, when I buy things, I expect that I'm going to get treated properly, that, that uh, I'm going to be treated courteously, that I'm going to be treated fairly, and I expect a, a certain level of customer service. I appreciate that. I hope, I'm certain you probably appreciate that as well. Everywhere we go in our world, uh, we expect things uh, to, on some level, cater to us, to serve us. Worshiping God in community can uh, take on a kind of a, a, a bad flavor in the sense of it can become about our tastes and our perceived level of service, even from the church organization and from leaders and I think by extension, even God. This, let me just say this very clearly. Friends, this is backward. 
this is backwards. Where, where we, in our culture, we have this idea of customer service and that all things kind of serve the consumer. When we come to church, it's a different kingdom, right? It's a different relationship. And if we bring that kind of consumer mentality into church, it can really, it could be a problem. And it, it's, it's backward and it needs to be fought against and even uh, to be undone. Now, let's be clear about something. On some level, a church worship experience does cater to an individual. I mean, you know, we don't meet in an open field, right? We come together and there's some level of of service for people and finding that fine line of what's serving people uh, and the service of gathering together versus what's serving, serving people's individual um tastes and perceived needs and all that. It's, a, it's kind of a fine line. And, and certainly, God wants to bless our lives, right? God wants to uh, bless our lives. He does. I mean, this is one of, the, one of the wonderful things about being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus, is He does make our lives better uh, in every way. He makes our lives better. But we must be really care- careful about this proper relationship. The psalmist says, all these things are your servants. His words, his ordinances, and I would say, by extension, even us, his people, we are his servants. He's not our servant. Uh, and this, again, in regard to our relationship in the church, the church exists on some level, certainly to serve the whole, Uh, But we must look at it as like God's ordinance. It's God's plan, and it exists to serve Him. And it it must always exist to serve Him primarily. Now, I want to look at an example uh, from uh, the Gospels. Uh, This comes from Mark chapter 2. You can turn there. Um, But it's an example of where we see uh, Jesus talking about how uh, God's ordinances exist to serve him and his purposes, okay? So uh, this is uh, Jesus having some interaction with the legalistic Pharisees over the Sabbath. Um, The Sabbath was that one day in seven that God gave as an ordinance for Israel uh, to set aside, uh, to serve him, to, to have a day of rest, have a day of worship. God modeled this, right, in the creation story. God rested from his work. He gave us an example of that. Um, and, and, and he gave it in the ordinances to have a day of rest. And so it's, it serves him and it serves his purpose. Now, now so they're, they're uh, calling into question some of the practice of the disciples of Jesus. It says, uh, Mark, 22, or Mark chapter 2, verse 23, It happened that he was, uh, uh, he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and he ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Here, Jesus is saying, listen, you guys have this backwards. You're, 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 you're legalists, and, and, and you feel like this whole thing is um, kind of this legalistic burden when really the ordinance was given to serve me. Right? Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. It's His Sabbath. It's, it's His creation. It's His Word. It's His ordinance. Right? And, and, and so he says, he's basically saying, you know what? Uh, I made this whole thing up, and it's intended to serve my purposes, not your legalistic purposes. And their legalistic purposes were always kind of the same, right? It's like, hey, if we follow this observance or if we follow this ordinance, then we can be righteous. That's not God's purpose, right? That that we would have a kind of self-righteousness through legal observance of, of God's Word. Um, 
And so when you think about it, the Sabbath, it's an ordinance from God, uh, one which which is translated to the church, right? It's one of those things that's carried over from Judaism into Christianity, uh, which, which of course, it's God's word. Uh, it's good. The law is good. The law stands. And we've adopted it. Uh, we've changed the day from Saturday being the Sabbath to Sunday being our day of rest. And it's a time, uh, it's, it's been a time for 2,000 years where the church gathers together, worships the Lord, uh, we fellowship, we encourage the Lord, we remember His sacrifice. Um, it's a family day. It's not a day of, of work. Now, we're not legalists in the sense of, you know, some people have to work on Saturday, so they take another day off for those purposes. But in general, we've held on to it uh, because it's, it's, it's good. But we must always remember that it serves God's purpose. And God's, God's purpose in the design of the ordinance is for us. So, so and, 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 and he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But it's not in the sense that it's, it's created to be a time to serve our needs. Uh, but then on the other hand, it is in the sense that it's kind of this proper relationship where it serves God's purpose. God's the master, Right. And so the ordinance serves his purpose, and his purpose is that his people would be healthy, right? His purpose is that we would be healthy, that we would be whole. And through setting aside this day, uh, we would be spiritually healthy. We would be revived spiritually. We would uh, be reminded of the word of the Lord. We'd be reminded of his ordinances, uh, that we would follow his ordinances. We'd be submitted to them. He's, right, he's the master. All these things serve him. And we serve him, and we get all this great benefit from it, right? The day of rest is good for families. It's good for individuals. Um, it's good, I would say this. This is something we've lost sight of in our culture. It's even good for businesses in a, in a holistic kind of way. It's, it's good. It's good for society to have a day of rest. And that's God's purpose, right? God's purpose is for blessing us. There's even a sense that the day of rest is, it just has physical benefits. We must always keep in view God's purpose. Everything serves Him and His will. And we serve Him by following these ordinances, recognizing that yes, there's benefit to us, but, but ultimately, all these things serve His purpose, and we likewise should desire to serve His purpose. Amen? Uh, we, we need to remember that. He doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve Him. And when we do that, when we apply what the psalmist writes about His commandment being exceedingly broad, when we apply God's Word, we get all these great benefits. But we're always seeking, we should always be seeking to serve Him and His purposes. And there's so many benefits here listed, and this is the, the great theme in Psalm 119. It's all about the Word of God and how the Word of God uh, brings us great uh, benefit in our relationship with Him. He says, listen, he says, uh, uh, moving on from the idea that all these things are your servants, he says, man, if your law hadn't been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I think about that so many times. If I hadn't, uh, you know, been born again and and come to realization that I needed Jesus uh, again through God's word, God's purpose to save people, right? If I hadn't acknowledged that, I wonder sometimes where where I I would have where I would be now if I'd even be alive. He says I would have perished, um, and he says, man, I, I'm not going to forget your precepts. I'm not going to forget your word. It's revived me. I would just say a hearty amen to that. Again, that's God's purpose in His Word. It revives His people. Um, I, I, I'm yours. He's crying out here in verse 94 and 95 with this common refrain. He's got some enemies. He says, the wicked wait for me to destroy me in 95. But he says, I'm yours. Save me. I've sought your precepts. I'm holding on, God, to your Word. And I'm going dilig to be diligent about that, he says at the end of verse 95, to consider your testimonies.
And then again, he closes in verse 96, just saying, hey, I've seen a limit, right? I've seen a limit to all perfection. Literally, that limit is, I've seen the end of things. Uh, That's something that, that Solomon wrote about. He said, I've seen the conclusion of things. I've seen the end of things. And here's what I've determined. God's commandment is exceedingly broad, right? It covers it covers everything. It stands. God's word stands. Friends, I hope God's word is standing in your heart. I hope you're holding on to it. Uh, God, we need, like no other time in my lifetime, we need to hold on to God's word, God's precepts, God's ordinances. Amen? We've got to hang on uh, to God's eternal word that's settled in heaven. And then always remember that all these things, our lives included, exist to serve Him. Let's make sure we have a proper relationship to Him and that we don't have this image that God exists or that the church exists or that spiritual things in general exist to uh, kind of satiate our desires and to cater to our perceived needs. They do that, but they do that only as we're submitted to God. We're His servants. Amen. And so that's the proper relationship that we need to remember. Hang on to God's words, friends. Hang on. Study the Bible. um, And God will bless you because that's His purpose. His word stands. And His purpose is to bless your life and to enrich your life. And it will do that as you serve Him. God bless you. I pray that you have a great rest of your week as we look forward to the 4th of July and celebrating uh, nationally uh, this great holiday, even though it's going to be a muted celebration. And we'll see you Sunday morning as we continue our study through uh, Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 5. I hope you join us for that here on Facebook and YouTube. Have a great rest of your week. God bless you.